Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. I'm Amy LeBlanc. I'm Director of Student Services here in Arlington Heights 25. And we appreciate you all coming out tonight to hear a little bit about making the transition from elementary school to middle school for students with IEPs. Um, we understand that this can be an anxiety provoking experience, often for parents, a little bit for our kids. Our kids are usually pretty excited. But we thought that we would give you an opportunity tonight to hear about some of the programs that we offer and to walk you through some components of the transition process, what to expect over the next couple of months as we're transitioning your fifth graders to sixth grade. So we have a panel tonight who are going to present on the different <coughs> programs that are available in middle school. And they'll talk a little bit about a typical middle school day and how that might be different for students with IEPs depending on the program that they're in. And then if you have questions, we'll be able to answer those for you tonight. So it's fairly casual. If you have a question while we're presenting, please feel free to raise a hand. We'll get started. So as I said, we know that um, this, this transition can provoke some anxiety, especially for parents, we find. So we will have a variety of events that will happen over the next couple of months, including tonight's event. Um, there will be tours of the middle schools and the programs that will happen later this year and then in the spring or in the fall before your students start. We have transitional IEP meetings that will happen in the spring. And then there are school-specific events. The timeline, um, planning meetings start between elementary and middle schools, and actually those happen today in this very room. Our middle school teams had the opportunity to meet with their counterparts in the fifth grade just to hear about students who are coming, get a general sense of what those students' needs are, and just have a chance to talk through what they see as their needs for sixth grade, get a sense of goals, talk about programming in preparation for the IEP meetings, bless you, that will occur later on. So in March, April, and May, your case managers will be reaching out to you to schedule an IEP meeting. It's a transitional meeting where really you're reviewing the goals from this year and you're talking about how that will change for middle school. You're making decisions about the types of classes that they'll go into. Will they have a resource period? Will they take a foreign language? Will they go to a program like our extended resource program or communications? So those conversations will happen March, April, and May, depending for your specific student and the building that you're in. In June, we transfer everybody's files. So if you're at Dryden, we transfer your file over to South. Um, we do that both electronically and then paper copies so that the teachers are ready when they come back in August, they have everything that they need to know about your child. And then in August, we have a variety of things that will happen. We have tours for students who may need them. Some students need to walk the building. They may need to have pictures taken of their classroom, of their locker, practice using their locker in the combination a couple of times, just get a feel for the building. We can accommodate that in August. Sometimes they just need to meet their teachers. So we can do that. Um, case managers will reach out to you in August just to get to know you, get to know your child, find out if anything significant happened over the summer that they need to know about, anything they need to address, and then school begins. So it's pretty quick. So our middle schools, both of them, offer pretty much the same programming on both sides of town, with the exception of one program. Um, both schools offer what we consider to be a resource period, so children, and we'll go through these very in depth, but we have a resource level of support, we have co-taught classes, we have small group classes. We have the extended learning program in both buildings. We have the individualized learning program in both buildings. And then we have a program called Communications, which is only at South. It's a very, very small program. It's intended for students who are on the autism spectrum who have very, very significant needs. Um, there are just a handful of kids in that program now. And I don't think that we have anybody going for next year, but the program serves kids in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And then we have additional supports that we'll talk about. So with that said, I'm going to step away and I'm going to let the panel talk you through the program so you guys can introduce yourselves as you talk about your section. Hi, I'm uh, Sue Minas and I'm one of the sixth grade resource teachers at Thomas. And I can just kind of give you a little overview of, of what's happening in the resource program. Um, this program is designed for students who need some assistance in either pre-teaching or reteaching in either reading, writing, or math. Those are the major areas. Um, they also need instruction based on individualized goals, and that's what we're going to go over when we come over to the fifth grade, the elementary schools, and go through the transition meetings. We'll be going over those goals. Um, we also have small group instruction, um, replacement curriculum with the reading and the math, um, organizational support, and that's a huge one for the middle school, and then also for preparing for tests. And that is kind of covered in that resource class that we have. And that's the, one of the questions that we always get. That resource class does take the place of the foreign language. So you really need to choose between those two. And students coming in with IEPs, we do recommend that they take the resource class over the foreign language. It really kind of helps them a lot. Some opportunities for integration. 
We have the general education class for science and for social studies. Those are the two major classes that they can go into. Um, for those two classes, they can have TA support in there, or they can try that on their own. Um, they have a home base, or we call it over at Thomas, a home room where they start the day or finish the day, um, that they have that as their base. They also go out for creative arts, which includes drama, IT, which is tech, um, art, home ec, what am I missing? World, world, cultures. world cultures. Thanks. Um, the world language we kind of... Oh, thank you. The world language, um, we kind of touched on that. They get a choice of the world languages or the language or the resource. And PE and lunch are also times for integration. Co-taught classes are when there's a special ed teacher and a general ed teacher in the classroom at the same time to support your students. Um, usually we move at a little slower pace, but not always. Um, our LA program moves pretty quick and kids need to keep up there. Um, the concepts that we can reinforce as the teacher is teaching, we can go around and help those students who need some reinforcement. Um, integration opportunities, again, the co-taught classes are available um, for special education as needed, so that would be something we would discuss again at the transition meetings. And then we also have small group, if they need um, a little bit extra on that, the slower pace, we reteach and teach again. Um, those are offered in both math and for the LA and the um, reading. And LA and reading are a block over at Thomas for us, so it's two periods together. Um, a lot of times we do use what's happening in the general education in our small group. Sometimes, depending on needs, we do have a, an alternate curriculum for that small group, depending on the needs. Um, Sometimes the students need a double dose of either math or of reading, so we can have a second class, and that would take the place of either a social studies class, they would have a second dose of math or reading, or they would take the place of their science. And again, whatever is individualized for the needs of the students, they can have that as well. That was a whole lot. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Um, If, if the student would, would the student would require that, that there would be a teaching assistant in that science class or in that social studies class, there could be a shared teaching assistant in there that would help out. So is that going to be then determined based on the IEP? Right, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Yes. The science and the social studies are in the general ed curriculum. They go out into those classes, but again, they can have the TA support in there, the teaching assistant, if needed. So that's, that's what we offer there. So they're either on their own or they have TA support. And a lot of times we can back that up then in the resource program. We can go over the vocabulary, help them study for tests, anything that they may need extra, they can get that in the resource class then. Science and social studies, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Some support, yes. For the transitional IEP meetings, how much advance notice do we have for scheduling purposes? Your, the, the school that you're at, that your child is at now, that case manager will contact you and you can set up the date and then we just come over to, to your school. Got it. Any others? Yes. No, they used to, but once we put it in the double, the two periods, it's, it's an all or nothing. You either have the LA reading component as a small group, or you have it as the general ed. I know. Because sometimes children need support in one and not the other. Right. I think the reason why they do that is because in the general ed classroom, it goes back and forth. It's not one period of LA and one period of reading. They kind of exist together. So if you're taken out from one period, you're missing a whole piece. It's not just a reading piece or a writing piece. It's not a discussion. Yeah, it's either all or nothing there.
Probably the discussion part would come, though, curricularly in terms of just programming. Am I Programming-wise, I'm Piper Boston, sorry, I'm the principal over at South Middle School. Um, from a programming perspective, I do think, though, we will look for matches, so sometimes we'll want to make sure that students are participating in the gen ed curriculum components or tools as part of that. So just include that as you're kind of considering what, what your child needs. To just kind of back off that, I mean, kind of go off of that as well. Um, if they can handle it in the general education, again, some of that can be supported in the resource if they need help in one or the other area. So we're leaning the same way you are, I think, is, is least restrictive, definitely. All right, so I'm Jennifer Tatera, and I am the Extended Resource Teacher at Thomas Middle School. And then this is Carrie Bauckham, and she is the Extended Resource Teacher at South. But for today's purposes, I'm gonna kind of cover Extended Resource and she's gonna cover another program called the Individualized Learning Program. So don't get confused though, we're both extended resource teachers. Um, so for our program, typically students who are in that program are two to three grade levels um, behind in all academic areas. Um, we have a very academic focus. Um, our students who come to our class usually require alternate curriculum. So a lot of times for reading, math, language arts, we'll always have an alternate curriculum, and also for social studies, we have alternate curriculums. Um, the students who come to our class require special education for more than 50% of their day. Um, you can look at your child's IEP and kind of see where they're at right now and kind of gauge what that would look like. Um, students in our class must be able to attend a whole group academic classes um, within our setting with the support of a special education teacher, TA assistants, um, and our classes don't ever go above 12 kids. So we always have a small group in our class. Um, some students may be able to attend core academics based off of their individualized learning pro or their individualized um, cases, obviously. So we don't ever look at one student and say you're in the extended resource program, so you can't be in anything else. We always look through each child and decide you know, if they're really good at math, they can push out and be in a gen ed math class and we can support them in a resource setting. Um, but we always try to go for the least restrictive environment. Um, and within our classes, it is, has sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So we don't just have sixth graders, we have sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Sorry, I'm on to the next one, thank you. <laughs> um, like I said, there's no more than 12 students per class and we have TAs. Um, we sometimes include push-in services for speech and for social work. Um, a lot of times our students use a lot of technology. I know Carrie and I both use a lot of technology to help the kids um, kind of formulate sentences. We use co-writer a lot. Um, we'll sometimes use graphic organizers on the computer. Um, some students may require assistive technology based on their needs. Students participate in ISAT testing or PARC testing. I guess we should switch that. Um, and a lot of times we use a lot of positive behavioral supports in our classrooms. Just kind of we have a general behavior plan for the whole class where we give a lot of positive reinforcement um, to really help support strong student skills. We really try to focus on a lot of student skills, problem solving, and also self-advocacy, especially as they're getting to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, we really focus on advocating for themselves and being able to know when they need help and being able to raise their hand when they need help instead of just running up to a teacher or sitting there and waiting for somebody to help them. So we really focus on that. Um, we also have integration opportunities. So all of our kids go to creative arts classes with their gen ed peers. They all go to PE with their gen ed peers. They're all in a homeroom or a home base with their gen ed peers. They all have lunch with their peers. Um, and like we said before, depending on the student, sometimes they may go into some other gen ed classes based off of their needs. Hi, I'm Carrie Bauckham. I teach the extended resource program at South Middle School. Um, but today I'm gonna talk about, um, share about the individualized learning program, which is offered both at Thomas and at South. Um, it is similar in some ways to the extended resource program, but you'll hear, um, you'll, you'll notice some differences as I go through it. So typically the students in the um, ILP program are three years below grade level. They also require um, more than 50% of their day within the special education setting. Um, the, there is a functional academic focus, um, and it's highly structured and routine. Um, the instructional materials are offered um, 
with visual, auditory, and a kind of a multi-modality um, setting. There's transdisciplinary models, so Stephanie will come in or our social worker, instead of the students coming out for services, there, there's a big push for the push in so that services are within the classroom. Um, there's also the positive behavioral supports built into their day to help the students focus on their student skills as well as their independence. This classroom is also a multi-age classroom, being 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, there are no more than 10 students in this classroom, and then there's also the support of the, there's the teacher and, as well as a teaching assistant in that classroom. Um, students in this classroom um, participate in the park, and there's also a number of them that also um, participate in the IAA, um, which is, what's it called now? The DLM, the Alternative um, Assessment for the State. Um, there's sensory and movement breaks built into their day as needed, as well as a lot of assistive technology, you know, teaching the students how to use technology so they can access the skills that they um, enhance their strengths um, and help compensate for their areas of weakness. The majority of their academic time is spelt, spent in the ILP program um, with a focus on building um, daily living skills, such as cooking, community interaction, social skills and as well as student skills, and science and social studies com, um, concepts are, are embedded in the curriculum in this, in this program. Students in the ILP um, program do go out for creative arts, a PE. Um, they may have home base in the ILP program with their, with their teacher and their group, or they may go out for it in the general ed, depending on um, their area of independence. They might, get, they might go out for home base with the teaching assistant support, or they might be in um, the majority of our ILP students are in their own home base so they can work on social skills. We might, um, they might do similar activities that the, that the general ed home base is doing, but with, at a modified, um, just modifying the concepts so the students can understand it. Um, and then they're in the lunchroom with their peers. And similar to, to all the programs, based on students' needs and strengths and weaknesses, there might be a class that they go out for um, that's not in the ILP program, depending on um, if they have a particular area of strength. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Stephanie Walker. I'm the speech language pathologist at South Middle School. Um, I'm at South with another speech language pathologist, and then at Thomas, they also have two speech language pathologists. So it's really a, a great environment. It's very supportive with all of these programs. Um, first, I'm going to talk about the communications program, which is only at South. Um, it's a program designed for students who need um, significant communication and social supports. Uh, it is a, a functional academic program. Uh, we have a lot of behavior supports built in. It's a very, very structured environment, and uh, it's transdisciplinary. Um, so a lot of the classes that we do in there are definitely co-taught by either the social worker or the speech language pathologist, um, and the program is embedded with a lot of sensory supports. Um, the um, kids in Communications also have great integration opportunities in creative arts, PE, home base, and lunch, um, with additional components as um, school jobs. Um, there's also a lot of sensory supports. We do a lot of life skills instruction and uh, independent activities. Um, so that's communications. So there are a lot of additional supports in, um, besides the programming continuum that we offer. We have occupational therapy, physical therapy, we have social work services, we'll talk a little bit about those tonight. Um, all available, push in, pull out, depending on the needs of individual students. We do have adaptive physical education. Um, the same teacher who services and supports students in the elementary building also does so at both middle schools. And then we have TAs, teaching assistants, who support students in physical education. It's daily when you get to middle school instead of twice a week. and so. Um, we tend to group students together when they need adaptive physical education because then we can have a TA in there to help support and modify activities as needed. Uh, we have speech and language. As Stephanie mentioned, uh, each of the middle schools has one therapist who focuses on the uh, educational programs and then one who supports students on more resource level, a, a child who has a speech and language only IEP or a resource IEP with some speech support. So there are two in each building and they may work on articulation, expressive and receptive language, processing. Um, again, push in, pull out. We have therapists who push in and support students during content area. They may push into a science class or an LA class to help students with content as needed. We, the speech pathologists work with students in the resource program. Um, and our job basically is to support the students' language skills as are re related to the academic and core curriculum. And that is mostly a pull out service, although um, 
this past year especially, we've started to do more push-in. Um, we also support the extended resource program and there we support students' language skills within the core academic classes or within, with a modified curriculum. Uh, we do a lot of social skills development. Uh, it's mostly pull out, although we do do a lot of push in. Um, it's nice because in both of our programs, we really do work very closely with the um, classroom teacher and extended resource and ILP. So um, there's a lot of um, cro crossing over with some of the things that the classroom will te teacher will do and we'll support it in speech and vice versa. <laughs> So that same message and those same skills are being worked on throughout the day. Um, we also work in the individualized learning program. We do a lot of functional language skills and life skills, social skills training. We do um, uh, community outings, which is really a lot of fun. Um, really works on a lot of the skills we're doing. It's, uh, we're highly collaborative with the classroom teacher and, so, and the social worker and the occupational therapist. Uh, it's a lot of push-in services and then some pull-out services. And then in communications, we work on functional language skills and life skills. We support in community outings. Again, we work with the classroom teacher, social worker, and occupational therapist. We work with nonverbal and verbal students. And in that class, it's a lot of push-in and a small amount of pull-out. Hi, I'm Jean Snyder. I'm one of the social workers. I work at um, Thomas Middle School primarily with the individual um, learning program and the extended resource program. So um, I just wanted to share that we, again, we work very collaboratively together with speech and language pathologists um, to work specifically on social communication skills. Um, we also work a lot in social skills and um, one thing that I feel like we focus a, a lot on in middle school um, is also emotional regulation. So being, you know, having to attend for long periods of time, how to transition from one class to another. Um, we probably focus, I put in parentheses, yoga there. Not everyone's getting yoga, but um, we do that um, quite a bit for our um, individualized learning program as a daily way of making sure that they do have a, a good amount of sensory input and are, are able to independently regulate themselves. And um, so we find that to be real helpful. I also wanted to mention the ways that the social work helps to integrate um, our students with special needs with the general education population. So um, we at Thomas have a peer mentor program um, and what that involves really depends on the student, but it can include um, lunch groups. So that is a really great way to have um, peer mentors paired with our, our um, students with special needs and have kind of a buddy there and a mentor. You know, I, I always talk to them when, when the kiddos say, you know, why don't I just meet with you one-on-one -on -one is, I say, you don't need to learn how to talk to a middle-aged social worker. You need to learn how to talk to other kids your own age. So that's kind of um, my, my model and my thinking in that. Um, in addition, we also have a lunch buddies just to make sure that they are practicing their conversation and um, practicing being in an environment and making sure someone's sort of got their back and watching out for them. So that's a nice segue into how we bring all of this together. So as we mentioned, you have a transition meeting. It's like an IEP, it is an IEP meeting, um, where we work with you to determine what the most appropriate level of support is to meet your child's IEP goals. So the middle school comes to the elementary building and they have a discussion about what are the expectations in those sixth grade classes, what is your child able to do independently in fifth grade, and we're looking for that balance. We're looking for that least restrictive environment where a child can be independent. Um, they will plan and structure the supports that your child needs. They'll design a transition support plan if that's needed. We have some students who may start out with more support during the first six to eight weeks of school, and then we'll start to phase that back. Um, we, have, we may have students who we say, we're gonna start the first, try the first semester in one class and then move into another class if they're showing that they're, they're performing very strongly. Um, we always want children to be successful, not set them up for failure. So we, we may say we wanna do more support in the beginning and then we'll scale it back as we see that a child is successful or as they're able to access supports and new strategies on their own. 
and then we'll communicate how those supports are implemented throughout the school day and work with you to set that program up. You'll see that there are some differences as you look at your fifth grade IEP to your sixth grade simply because of the structure of the day. So in an elementary building, we tend to work on a 30 minute block. Middle school works on a 40 minute block. So it may change your speech and language minutes a little bit. So they may go up, they may go down. Um, again, we have to have some flexibility within the structure of the school day, but it's based on what your child's needs are. If they need more support in a middle school level, we're gonna bump the support up. If we feel that they can go from having 60 minutes to 40 minutes, then we'll ease it down a little bit and then have a plan to monitor that. So it's very individualized. It's all based on your child. And so you may talk to a neighbor who says, well, I had this for my child. We do it based only on your child and the data that we have, what their goals are and what their needs are. And that's why both teams are at the table and why you're there as well um, to be a part of that conversation. We've introduced a lot of information. Currently, we've introduced the resource program, the extended resource program, and the individualized learning program, and the communication. So we've introduced four different lanes, and we're expecting you to walk out of here knowing the difference between all of them. So hopefully, you've all received the handout. So you can take what you've learned and then look at it again before your IEP meeting with the team at your school. So I'll make the assumption that all of you have a child with an IEP, but I can't make the assumption all of you have a child that's been through middle school. So if I could just get a flavor for how many of you are sending your first child to middle school next year. So that's about half of this group. So the first thing I would acknowledge is that there is no typical day in a middle school, <laughs> but I do enjoy the title of this slide, the typical middle school day. <laughs> What I can share is that on both sides of town, we do have 10 periods in a day. All students at Thomas start the school day in a homeroom. It gives us a chance to watch Channel One, take attendance, and then give our own student news at Thomas. I believe that same is happening, but at the end of the day at South. Is that correct? The beginning of the day. It's right. So it's also the beginning. I spend a lot of time on the north side, not as much on the south. So I don't know exactly the, the nuances at South. So thank you for correcting me, Carrie. Um, all students do participate in the physical education program, the lunch, the creative arts, and academics at their ability. So these are common experiences among all of the programs that we've introduced to you today. Um, in addition to what we don't have here is all of the clubs and the other exciting activities that happen at the middle school. And if your child is unable to participate in a lot of those events without, or unable to participate without support, that's a conversation you need to have at your child's IEP meeting. We want them to participate in the extracurricular activities, but they're going to require TA support. If you have that conversation and it's deemed required by your IEP team, you're a part of that team, then it can be put in the IEP. It does happen, I'll say it's rare, but it does happen and it allows children who would otherwise be unable to do it independently support and that could be myself it could be resource teachers it could be social workers it could be occupational therapists a lot of us jump in as that support role but before all of those events where your child is going to participate it, it helps to know 24 hours in advance so we can plan which adult will be available but it has been a wonderful addition to our IEP conversations when you think about the middle school experience it it is beyond the school day it's before and it's after so keep that in mind at your child's IEP meeting I'd say the best way to start becoming aware of the activities is to start going on the website. South po posts a ton of information on their website. They post some student news. You can see what's coming up on the activities. I'll brag about Thomas. If you go into the announcements link on the front page, you can see our daily announcements. And that's what's verbally introduced and in video to our kids every morning. So you can see what activities your kids could participate in if they were a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader at Thomas this year. So please start to take a little more interest in how would my child participate in some of those activities if they were currently at the middle school and what supports would they need. I think that's really important to think about. Um, the next slide talks about other supports available um, at the middle school. You know, I often hear fifth grade teachers talk about, you know, talk about the middle school to their fifth graders, yet they may not really know what it's like. You know, you better have yourself organized and 100% prepared before you get to middle school, otherwise you're gonna just flounder. 
if that were true, we wouldn't have jobs. <laughs> so every single teacher at the middle school level is contractually required to stay after school until 3.15. The school day ends at 2.45, so there's a half hour available for support. So I can speak specifically to Thomas uh, at the teams, Alpha and Beta, they decide one teacher per day that stays after school, and then all of the kids that want to stay or are selected to stay, <laughs> invited to stay, can go to that teacher's classroom. But all of the other teachers are there, so oftentimes if there's a math question and it's the science teacher who is responsible for staying with the kids, they will send them to the math teacher to get the direct help they need. So that's often what's happening so that kids can get really good support and a head start on their homework at the school level. For those of you who do have a, a student who would ride a bus, they have an activity bus that leaves at 3.35. And I don't know if we talked to you about when the school day begins yet. <laughs> the school day actually begins at 7.50 a.m. Most of the kids at Thomas are standing and ready by 7.35 at the door. And those who want extra support in math or with other teachers they've arranged, a lot of kids are coming in with me at about 7 a.m. to get extra help. And if they are in band or other activities, you're getting up pretty early. Um, so just be aware there are lots of other supports available. Study skills is um, a class we offer to gen ed students. I would call it resource for those with IEPs. So when you hear about study skills opportunities, in my language, that is a student that is not with an IEP, but they require some tier two support. Um, so when I, when I would talk to parents who have children with IEPs, I would be referring to the resource class that was talked about at the very beginning of this presentation. So if you want some details, we can always talk about it, but there's a slide with some information. 11th hour is what I was talking about from 2.45 all the way until 3.15. Students can get direct support from their teachers. Social work services, I know we talked about that. Social work is also provided for a lot of kids without IEPs. Um, you can imagine middle school, you remember, it's a very exciting time in one's life. And we have three social workers on each side of town. That's six social workers in Arlington Heights at the middle school level. That's a lot of help. And they do service the minutes that are on the IEPs, and they also service the general education population when the needs arise, which is every day. Um, and I would encourage you to reach out directly to these support personnel, whether it's a social worker, the occupational therapist, the speech and language therapist, pathologist, check that in the records. I would encourage you to reach out directly to them when you know who you are working with or who your child will be working with directly. Is that my time? <laughs> um, we have a response to intervention support. So, that would, I would call it tier two, you may know it as RTI, and that's what it is there, response to intervention. You might also hear it as MTSS, multi-tiered systems of support. So it's basically providing support for children. Typically, in a case where a child has an IEP, you would just work with the IEP team. But on occasion, you may have a student with an IEP, but they're also getting tier two support outside of their IEP. But that's pretty atypical, that's not normal. Um, but we do have these supports for a lot of general education students. Um, dedicated staff and administrative teams. I love how we've a dedicated right there. We give a lot of time and energy. I think this is one of the best nights that we offer as a kickstart for parents who have children with IEPs, just so you know what the options are as you go into a meeting that you are probably going to be unprepared for, even though you're here at this meeting. But this allows you to reach out to some people you've now met and ask some questions. Say, hey, I saw you at this night. I still have some questions about this topic. And I, I'm reading this information about the extended resource. I'm really struggling. What is the difference between that and the IOP program? I would gear yourself with as much information as possible before you meet with the school-based team where that decision will be made. What's nice is that it's a much smaller group and all of the people at that team know your child. And so just keep in mind, you are a very important part of that puzzle, and that is the one reason we have this night, to give you some information, to arm you before you go into those meetings. 
Uh, math lab and homework club, I can only speak to what's offered at Thomas. I'll have someone at South kind of talk about that. Math lab is something that we offer at Thomas Middle School in the morning. There are kids that do start at 7 and are in math lab all the way through 740, 745. And then homework club, I would say that's synonymous with 11th hour. Um, a lot of teachers offer support during lunch hour as well, but 11th hour is typically also known as homework club. We, and we don't have a specific math lab, but we do have a flexible 6th, 7th, and 8th period, um, which is our three lunch shifts, um, where students can kind of flex in and flex out for, for supports. And um, a lot of our math teachers rely on that. And then, like Thomas, we have 11th hour after school, um, which is facilitated different ways um, for both teams. And then really case managers, too, often really encourage and, and want to have their kids back in the room, too, to um, kind of help be a second support, a second check-in, especially that's a great way to build that accountability on the organization and uh, you know all, all of that, you know, filling out the assignment notebook and some of those. So a lot of that happens during 11th hour. I'm going to echo what Brian said. You're, you're going to have so many steps to this, so we really don't want to inundate you, but we certainly kind of want to prime you for you know what to kind of look for and ask. But not unlike the elementary, we just want to encourage you that it's always a fluid process. So like Amy said, you know, we might err one way or the other, but we'll want to initiate and have those conversations with you and, and kind of get it right for each year. I would say the only other things that I would highlight in terms of differences, um, Really, everything is pretty similar. If, if they're different, it's just we call it a different thing or a different version. But we, like Brian said, the day extends, and that's an important part of the day. So once you feel like your, your student and your child kind of gets used to the rhythm, and they will. Um, I used to teach fourth and fifth, and I used to be a fifth grade teacher, like, oh, what will it happen? Oh, it's great. And they're usually smiling and loving life. and. Um, you know, showing you how they open their locker 10 times in a row after a while. So they will be in good hands. I think I do want to, uh, Sue did a nice job of broaching this, but it probably where we have the most early conversations, and it's a little why we planned this meeting for when we did, is the world language discussion. Um, because sometimes that feels like a really big choice to choose the resource time, which really is the time for the case manager to check in, to offer that. Um, gen ed, social studies, or science, it's kind of a catch-all for a lot of pre-teaching, re-teaching. So we do really value that time, but we are sorry that it tends to compete with that world language choice. I will say over the years, for some of you who have had students come through or have recently experienced, our world language program has become much more flexible, especially since we started offering at sixth grade. So we do have options for kids down the road. We are really aware of their trajectory going into high school. So definitely have those conversations, but I would also trust the team in terms of what they feel like is a priority going into middle school, because we have definitely had students transition at all grades successfully and make successful transitions to high school where world language is still a very viable option, but that sixth grade year is so important to us too to kind of set the stage and get them grounded. So that's probably where you're going to have the first early early thoughts and so I know we have our world language night next week and we even encourage you to go ahead and put an option in and and kind of help us know what we should earmark but then you know in talking with your current child's teacher and case manager and then in the spring we'll we'll kind of help make those decisions with you and and want to hear what you have to say so I think that those were my only big highlights so for the sports that are offered for sixth grade that would be track and cross, no, track is not, is it? I think it's cross just country. cross country. And cross country starts on both sides of town in the summer, usually mid-August, and then continues about a month and a half, two months into the school year. Um, for those who are in cross country, that is your activity after school. So there is not an option to go to 11th hour while you're involved in a sport. But that is the only sport you can participate in outside of clubs and activities and intramurals as a sixth grader. I'm going to interject, and I don't know if it's the same. I, I do know, though, that um, the coaches are usually pretty flexible. And so if a plan is put in place, even if they just need a quick checkout and they arrive to practice later, they'll want a safe plan if they're going around the campus. But sometimes we have students who can start. Usually all of our sports activities 
surpass the activity bus time, that 335 time, so they're usually pretty extended after school. Whereas most clubs, though, which your sixth graders might be interested in, Brian's right, that will also kind of compete with that 11th hour. Those will get kind of started more in October, and so I think that's when you can kind of know and have a pulse of how your child's doing. Um, for Thomas, what we have is the case manager is your contact person, and every day the team meets one period a day, so we get to talk to the whole team together. So if there is a communication that you want us to tell the whole team or just with the case manager, that can be done daily. We have feedback forms that are sent home every Friday, and what that is, it's a form that has your child's schedule, and each teacher fills out if there's any missing assignments, any comments that they have, tests that are coming up. So every week you'll get that sent home, and that needs to come back with your signature. That's how we do it at, at Thomas. Also, you have Edline that you can check online for the grades, and teachers usually update that weekly, at least weekly. Please feel free to contact your child's current case manager if you have questions, if you're starting to think about world language, um, what's the plan for that. If you're wondering, if you feel like you heard something tonight that sounds like a really good fit and you want to have that conversation before your transition meeting, please reach out to your child's case manager. Um, you can always contact me. You can contact one of the coordinators. Uh, Lisa Cramp is in the back. Do you want to wave and say hello? Uh, she's the liaison for South Middle School. And then Maggie Wade, who is not here tonight, is the liaison for Thomas. And their contact information is here as well if you have specific questions. So thank you very much for coming. We'll be here for a little while. And so feel free to come up and ask questions if you have specific questions that you want to ask a member of the panel. Thank you so much for giving us your time and for entrusting us with your children and have a wonderful night.